Support for Jacked Ramsey is brought to you by Manscaped. Manscaped offers precision engineered tools for your family jewels. Manscaped just launched their fourth generation trimmer, the Lawnmower 4.0. You heard that right, the 4.0. Join over 2 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer for you 20% off free worldwide shipping with a code JACKED. 20 at manscaped.com again that's jacked 20 at manscaped.com and why go with manscaped well manscaped engineered the ultimate groin and body trimmer by focusing on intelligent functionality and an incredibly comfortable grooming experience their fourth generation trimmer features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents thanks to their advanced skin safe technology i now feel confident shaving my boys so remember, get 20% off and free shipping with a code JACKED20, that's J-A-C-K-E-D-2-0, at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use the code JACKED20. Unlock your confidence and always use the right tools for the job with Manscaped. What's going on, everybody? Welcome into Jack Ramsey's. I'm your host, Danny Morang, joined as always by 1080 the fans, Brandon Sprague. Uh, what, what, what else? What, I mean, you've got 1080 the fan. You've got BetQL. I mean, what, what, what else you got? I mean, you, I, I got to get a script for the intro bio here. I, like, it's 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 a little it's a little much, man. I need you to calm down. Uh, it is a little much. I'm learning that as the season's going on <laughs> that it's a lot of commitment. I'm also on a podcast you may or may not have heard of called mm. Jack Ramsey's. Mm, it's uh, right. It's blazer heavy with a little NBA mixed in. I host it with an absolute douche canoe named Danny <laughs> Moran. And uh, we have a lot of fun giving our hot takes and thoughts Love on the it. trailblazers. <laughs> oh, God. It's such a good, it's a, such a strong word or, or, or oh, compound word, right? What, not I a compound word. What's, what's the, what's the word I'm, when you hyphenate it? Anyways, I'm not an English major. I was a poli sci international studies guy. There you go. <laughs> Screw off. <laughs> I'm also not an English major, but I'm a comms guy, so I can just say things and not know what I'm really saying. You oh, know that's, what I mean? that's effectively that. how comms works. Yeah, yeah. Just, you, you deal with ramifications down the road. That's, that's people, how this works. Uh, people always ask, uh, hey, where'd you go to college? And I'll say like, oh, I went to Oregon State. And they're like, oh, it's awesome. What'd you major in? And I, and I was like, I didn't major in anything. I took the easiest route to a degree, and uh, I took one math class in four years. That's <laughs> it's, it's, it's almost a fake. I paid $23,000 to say I went to Oregon State. Which, and learn nothing else. That's, I mean, it's not bad. Some no, people, some people pay a lot more money for a lot less. So it's very, very true. Um, we won't get into into college loans here. I think it's a, it's a bit much for Jack Ramsey's. But what we will dive into is a lot of questions spurred on by uh, the Athletics. Jason Quick uh, had a article talking about the already burgeoning relationship between uh, Yusuf Nurkic and head, new head coach Chauncey Billups uh, about roles and responsibilities and things of that nature. Um, uh, first of all, I mean, you read the article, correct? Yeah. What was your initial takeaway? You know, I, I, I can't help but hold on to one point. First of all, I, I thought it was a good article. I also enjoyed his piece on Chauncey, mm -hmm. you know, how he kind of became a coach and staying with, uh, Tyron Lou. And I thought that was a really good story to kind of see the backstory of Chauncey as a coach. The thing that sticks, sticks out. And, and I know this is, this is sticking probably, your craw. Yeah. It's been echoed. I'm sure by somebody or somewhere. I just don't understand. What is the necessary reason that Nurkic needs to kind of take shots at Terry without directly taking shots uh, at Terry with saying Terry's name? You know, Yusuf obviously well, I mean, is frustrated. It starts, from, it starts from the top. Well, when your sure. boss is taking shots, it sets the tone. Sure. I don't refute that. But, like, to discredit what Nurkic, what Terry and the Blazers were able to do for Nurkic coming from Denver and to kind of look at Chauncey as, like, he's going to save my life type of a viewpoint, man, you're, you're losing me with this. And, and I, I've noticed this about Nurk. I really like Nurkic. I think he's fantastic on the court. He brings so many different dynamics mm -hmm. to what the Blazers are. And I know this is a heightened time for him on social to go after people who question anything about him. But that being said, man, I can't help but say this. Sometimes he does or says things that kind of makes me just go, bro, unnecessary. Like Put the, the end of the down. season – Post game presser. Yeah, I didn't get enough touches. Damian Lillard scoring fifty five, or you scoring eighteen? I don't know which one I want more. Hmm, let me think about it. So, like, I love Yusuf Nurkic. He's been fantastic as a Blazer, but he also has these moments, and I feel like it was highlighted a little bit in the quick piece of. I just kind of look at him side eyed, like, really, man, really, you needed to say that. And I think it's kind of in those instances. This is maybe a bit of a cheap shot, 
but I'm going to take it anyways. I like Nurk. In fact, I love Nurk. Uh, I, I have a soft spot for more traditional big men, guys who can play down the post, show post footwork, playmaking, those, like Sabonis and those kind of guys. Those, those are some of my favorite players of all time. I think Nurk can slide into that, that, that role, not necessarily that level, while well, incredibly effective. He also sometimes just needs to shut up and play basketball. And I, I, I love him. But like you said, the, the end of season stuff were, was I'm not getting enough touches and uh, I'm not happy with my role. And then I don't know if I'm going to be here. And then, you know, fouling out in three games. It's just, it, he's, it's, I think it's easy to see how some of the stuff bubbled up in Denver that mm-hmm. led to him wanting out because he was a little bit immature. Don't get me wrong. Denver kind of did him dirty. Like that played us into it a hundred percent, but also you need to deliver if you're, if you're acting like you, you want, and then this isn't unique to Yusuf Nurkic by any means. There's so many players in the NBA where fit and location and team responsibility and role, all that stuff is really, 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 really important. <laughs> why it's why guys who may be a dumpster fire in one place get to another and all of a sudden they look like a solid NBA player. It's because mm-hmm. of the surroundings and everything else. And I think Nurk has shown that for the most part. But he's also been incredibly injury prone. He's been one of the most, if not the most, inconsistent finishing big in the league over the last five years. And when he's been put in situations to be more successful, he has delivered at times. You can, again, Jason highlighted this in the piece, the the 25.5 5 by 5 game and the play-in game. But he's also fallen incredibly short. And while CJ in the backcourt takes a big shot for how god-awful they were against Denver, Nurk was also a disaster in key moments, even though he performed well in the box score. Mm -hmm. So, well, I I mean, just what this line, you know, this is one that stuck out, uh, stood out. Stuck out. I I, I like stuck out. Stuck out. Comms major again. Um, (laughs) Just keep going. You know. This line that quick kind of echoes from Nurkic without using a direct quote, but it's basically what Nurkic says. Mm. More than any other time in his career, Nurkic said he felt like a coach believed in him, valued him, and wanted him. And I can't help but like scratch my head and go, so not at any point did Terry believe in you, value you, or want you? He inserted you in the starting lineup as soon as you got traded. You could say, well, they needed to do it. Well, he still did it. He yeah. didn't have to do it. And they he ran the it. offense through him a fair amount of times, but it – Let's let's take the, let's let's dissect they that the exact piece. Valued him. Terry was probably cool with them paying him the first time he was up for a contract and believed in him. I mean, what does that even mean? D- Terry, again, to your point, ran stuff through him in year one. Like he was the difference maker for what they were. What's that the number one play that they run? Around. What's the number one play that they run? Is it a Damian Lillard, Yusuf Nurkic pick and roll? It's it's a high pick and roll. Yes. With who? It's with not, Yusuf Nurkic. It's, it's not CJ McCollum and a power forward. It's not Damian Lillard in a power forward. It's not a 1-3. It's Damian Nurk. Yeah. He's involved in everything. He built his entire defense around him. And while Nurk wants, I want to be more aggressive. Terry's probably sitting there saying, I'd like to be more aggressive too, but you can't stay on the floor. Yeah. Right. So it's like the self-awareness from Nurk and that was kind of frustrating. And mm. as I read the article, I found myself getting fr- like genuinely frustrated with Nurk for the first time probably ever like there's been times where I'm like, you know, frustrated in the sense of please, for the love of God, stop throwing flip shots at the rim. Yeah. Please stop taking stupid fouls. Please come to camp in shape. Like, those are more mild frustrations. This was like the, his general idea was frustrating. And like you said, the whole idea of highlighting, like, like he was somehow persecuted in Portland, you know? And it was like, mm-hmm. listen, man, I, I get it. I, I, you weren't in the ideal position that you want more run through you, especially, and let's, let's not forget. What's the most important thing about this season for Yusuf Nurkic? Contract. There you go. Yeah. So if you're, if you're wondering, we talked about this last week and the whole idea of a guy coming off the bench and roles and perceptions and everything that goes along with that. Does that impact Yusuf Nurkic right now? If you don't think that Yusuf Nurkic saw the money handed out this summer, you were out of your ever loving mind. Out of your mind. Clint Capella got paid. Oh, Clint Capella did get paid. If you don't think that Nurk is looking at that, and whether you think Capella's on or Nurk is on Capella's level, that that's, doesn't matter. It's about right. what an agent says he's worth. And remember, he's rep by clutch. 
So Nurk is going to do this, and I, I'm almost certain this is at the behest of his management, to elevate his profile. Get more touches. Get more involved. Be more front and center. Show your value. Mm-hmm. Because this is the last big contract you're going to get. He's a 28, 27, about to be 28-year-old big man with massive, massive injury history going into a contract year on a team that's on the precipice of either making wholesale changes if Dame decides he, he wants out after the season yeah. or committing fully to a team that's going to cost a truckload of money. Now, can I ask you this question? And it, it kind of piggybacks off what we've mentioned so far. Mm. You know, another thing that stood out to me was, and I had to find where it was exactly, but I, it was kind of near the middle part of the, the piece. It says, um, you know, Nurk is beyond happy because for the first time in his career, it sounds as if he will have a prominent role both on offense and defense. And I, I was a little confused by that just in the – I thought he was a prominent player on defense and on offense, he, but – He was a singular most important defensive player for this team every year that there, he's been active. Danny, there, there's six games below 500 when he doesn't play. Like we saw in the yep. playoffs, like when he played against Golden State, I know they didn't look great and they ended up losing those games by double digits. But there were – when he came back from the broken leg, they were up 16 points when he came back from that injury and then he couldn't go anymore. His body couldn't hold up. He came back early. And when he left, obviously they blew the lead. They ended up losing the series, but I, I guess I just, I maybe disagree with Nurkic just there. I, I don't know if he thinks he can be just like Jokic and go win a league MVP, but I've always I think kind that's, of that's felt, part of it. I genuinely well, do believe that he does he does see himself that way. But he can't stay on the floor with with Jokic when he plays him. Like if you can't stay on the floor against the guy you're aiming to be, isn't that kind of your answer? Because I always viewed him as a prominent role in offense and defense. And the piece just highlighted that basically it sounds like he hated playing here for Terry. That's kind of the vibe I get when I read all his quotes. When I kind of take away from the story, it's a good piece. It's a good get by quick. But my 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 reaction to Nurk specifically is like, so you've never been happy since you got to Portland because the vibe is basically, hey, Terry's gone. I can finally be who I want. I'm like, what did he, What were you able to do when Terry was here? And it's it, you made me think about it here real quick. So this is yeah, this is the group of players that are in front of him in usage rate in the NBA who played. This is Bigs who played at least 20 minutes a game. Tell me who he should be in front of here on this list. Joel Embiid. Nikola no. Jokic. No. Nikola Vucevic. No. Anthony Davis. No. Carl Anthony Towns. Uh, I know this is going to be a hot take. I wouldn't I wouldn't dismiss it. That's insane, but we'll, we'll leave that one. <laughs> Julius Randle. Uh, the answer again is no. Okay. okay. This, this is when you can start to make this, this hey. next guy. Let Nurkic cook in New York for a year. Can he pull up Randall's stats? Can he do what no, Julius did? No, probably but, not. But but let him let him do it for a year. Okay? It would be fun, but hey, it also would lead to the Carl Anthony Towns thing. You're right. I admit that I'm not actually dying. He's on probably that hill. the best offensive big in the league right now. But the thing with Town, Towns is it's incredibly frustrating to see how just truly god awful they are as an organization. Yes. With there's, him as well. There's no doubt about that. And so let's but, go to, sk- but skill-wise, no, not no. realistically. No. Now, here's here's one you can make an argument for. Andre yeah. Drummond. I would he, take Nurkic in a minute. 100%. Yeah, Porzingis. Come on. Yeah, I would take, I would take yep. Nurkic. Although, they, you know, that's a coin flip of who's going to play more games. Yes. Uh, another guy who's had some injuries, but has a big profile, a big-time year coming for him because I'm a huge fan of him. Triple J, Jaron Jackson Jr., I like I like Triple J. I, I still need to see a little more. He's still young. He came back yep. from that injury. Sabonis. Uh, I think Sabonis. that's what you're hoping Nurk turns into offensively. I love Sabonis, man. I'm a big – and it's not just because of the name. I think he's truly no, like he's a, a stud. really you, you can run good – He has proven yes. you can run an offense through him. Yep. Uh, Bam Adebayo. I take Bam okay. all day. This is, again, this, this is another name. James Wiseman. Yeah, Nurk, yeah. yeah. Okay, the next on this list, Aldridge. Nurk now. Yeah. yeah. Then Al Horford. Nurk. Okay. And now you're at yeah. Yusuf Nurkic, Jonas Valanciunas, uh, and John Collins, who I think are all... Those are two really good players in their own right, and you could probably say they're better than Nurk in some way. And ways. their usage rates are yeah. nearly identical. Nearly identical. Okay, so for, for, for clearance here, the stats that I was using here in the glaring white screen, because NBAStats.com is a monster... Um, Use of Nurkic's usage rate is at 21.7. Basketball reference, I believe, calculates it as 22.5 because they have slightly different things that they use for that. But 
that's a higher usage rate than Capella, than mm-hmm. DeAndre Ayton, than Miles Turner, than Brooke Lopez, than Jarrett Allen. I mean, the only guys who are in front of him are absolute offensive hubs, Joel Embiid, Nikola Jokic, Vucevic, Davis, Cat, Randall, and then yeah. Drummond, Porzingis, Jackson, and then Sabonis, Bam, and, and Wiseman. So if you're talking about like how much usage he's getting, he's touching the ball. He's involved with everything on the offensive so, end. Okay, so then walk walk guys like me, like me and you, I, I can go to a certain point with X's and O stuff, and then mm. you'll probably pass me by, and that's okay. Tell me then as a – explain this as if I'm five. <laughs> what is Yusuf Nurkic doing differently on offense that's going to suddenly unleash this Nurkic that for some reason I guess just we haven't seen exist – Except a, a few handful of games, they're going like, to use him as the primary initiator. That's what they're. That's the only thing they can for the whole season. For the here's whole the season, we're buying that. Well, here's the thing. Also, I, maybe Neil can maybe re-sign him. We don't even know if he wants to stay here. And that's that's the thing is that there's there's another line in that from from quick directly from Nurk where he says some guys might get a point or three less and. That's you can you absolutely unequivocally know who he's talking about. He's talking about Dame and he's talking about CJ. That's his way of saying they're doing a little too much dribble and I want the ball a little bit more. Did you think he uh this is not gonna create any real drama here on the podcast because he was at his wedding, they're like brothers. I did view his postseason comments as sh- um uh, subtle. Shots kind of at Damon CJ. Of, 100%. They they could be doing a lot less and I should be doing a lot more. That's kind of how I, and I remember hearing that on a golf course. And I remember my first thought was out of here. F out of here. Yeah. Get out of here. What? Take the ball out of Dame's hands. I don't know if I want that with Nurkic. And here's the thing. I, this is where I, I, I think it's a good idea, but it's also dangerous. Okay. Because it alleviates pressure on Damon CJ because it is it is easier to create from the middle of the floor with Yusuf Nurkic because it will put more actions in place for guys off ball. It eases the burden and the workload for Damon CJ. So the excuse of well they carry so much offensively gets turned down a little bit on the defensive end if they both suck defensively. Okay. Then it becomes it's about them, not about their workload. So I think that part is a, is a is something that that should definitely be leaning into but here's the flip side Yusuf Nurkic has not played a season where he has shown that he is not going to break down so now you're going to up his usage rate and have him more involved when he's already shown that he's brittle and so when you're looking at the scales here how important are things as they pertain to that where is that magic level where you're you already can't get 30 minutes a night out of Yusuf Nurkic and now you want to turn him into more of a workhorse well, and that's the other part that I think Nurkic probably knows but didn't acknowledge or bring up is, are you going to be able to play 34-minute nights? No. Are you going to be able to he's, go for 35? He is, he is not capable of, of, of playing over 30 minutes a night. Then you're, have, not reaching, already... you're, you're never reaching Jokic level. Nope. And and the other thing that I'm taking away from Billups, and you know, I, again, I've said I think they're going to play really well for Chauncey. I think positive things are going to happen. There's times when change happens, and it's necessary, and that's fine. I think the thing with Chauncey, though, it's great to say all these off-season, preseason. Oh, he's hitting the cliches things. like he he's stepping 100%. up like like Barry Bonds in the prime, baby, just smacking but, it out of the park. But Danny, what is he doing? What's Chauncey doing the minute he loses four games in a row? What's he doing when he loses five of his last seven <laughs> games? You, you're not, you, yeah, because you're you're in the moment. You're not going to be like, well, we need to keep running everything through Yusuf and Dame and CJ. You guys shoot three times less per game. That's not happening. Yeah. So I think some of this is a little pie in the sky by Nurkic. I don't blame him. He's at, look, he's fighting for more money. He wants a big contract. I, I get and he all wants that. to be more involved because he looks at Sabas. He looks at at Vucevic. He looks at Jokic. He looks at Aiden. He looks at Embiid. And he sees these guys and the importance that they they have for these franchises. And he knows that he's already the defensive anchor. But that doesn't get you paid. I just I, you're yeah. on the other end. You know? I just my last thought on on Nurkic is I feel like a lot of this is lip service and and this can all mean well and good, but I, I just think some of the shots at Terry, I think some of the 
this is going to be this with Chauncey. I think some of that's a little pie in the sky, man. I, I'm not on September 19th going to invest that this is going to be concrete for an 82 game schedule. when We start in what late October with game one. Let's wait and see, right? Like some of this stuff sounds good in theory. It's another to be in the moment and to see it continuing to go that way. I, I'm not so convinced by that. And I think this is something Chauncey will learn his first time coaching. He's going to be like, all right, am I sticking to my guns now? Is this working? Should I move? Should I pivot? Like those are moments you can't talk your way through. You can only experience it. So it's great to talk about in the off season. It's another to go through that once the season gets going. All right. We spent the first basically 20 minutes of this podcast talking about the generics of the article. And this is a mailbag pod. So oh. I want to get a, and no, no, it's, I, I actually think it was a good thing to do. I want to get this question in. This is from, uh, from the homie Evan M at Evan M. Uh, given the recent love fest between Nurk and Chauncey in the media, combined with the facts that Nurk is a contract year and the Blazers have $92.5 million tied up between Dame, CJ, and Norm starting next year, would it even be possible to bring Nurk back next offseason if he has a solid slash healthy year? Or would it behoove Neil to flip Nurk at the deadline for assets, similar to how Neil moved on from Plumlee in 2017, where we ironically acquired Nurk? Um, I'll start because I'm sure you have more explanation on the cap and everything that they're facing financially. I would guess that no, because of the norm contract and their refusal to deal CJ. If they're in a competing position come trade deadline, I think he's more willing to just lose Nurk outright in free agency than flip him for any piece. I think he'll just be content to be a playoff team and roll back in and give it another shot and see what happens. And then Nurk either leaves or signs some kind of deal, but it, it's hard for me financially to see that working out for them to get to keep Nurkic uh, after this year. So there's a couple things here that are a little bit terrifying because the okay. Blazers were on the precipice of losing Norman Powell and being entirely screwed this off season. Like they were, it was scary, right? That was, there was a legitimate possibility that Norm is gone and you have lost an asset for nothing. If you're the Blazers, you have next to nothing left in the cupboard. You have given up your draft picks. Your young guys really aren't young anymore. Ant's going into year four. Nas is going into year three. Greg Brown is a, a nice flyer. We'll, we'll see what he turns into, but he's still he's in, he's in that Blazer incubator for two years, right? So what do you do if, if Nurk leaves? What do you do if Nurk leaves? Because the only thing you have is you have the bird rights to keep him. You can go over the cap. You're going to pay $20 million a year? You're going to pay that Clint Capella money for Yusuf Nurkic when you've got, like you said, $93 million tied up in the three other guys. You're going to go over the cap in four guys and not be a title team. That's insane. He's at, is, is he around 12 to 13, right? Isn't that what his He's at 12 is? right now. Yeah. 12, that's Listen, right. Okay. For, for me, 18 is the number. 18, that's the highest you'll go. That's the highest I'm going. But you, we, we don't want, I mean, you hope to God. If it's the Blazers, you hope, 14, you hope it's 15. Yeah, I was safe, 15. Yeah. 18 is like, mm, you're clutch and we like you yeah. and Dame likes you and ah, you know? Yep. But because it, it's just going to, and this doesn't like save the billionaire's money. This is like tradable contract. What can you do with it? Like, is this going to be something that you regret doing? And the Blazers just can't put themselves in that position without, having real assurances behind it. Yeah. Um, but they're going to have to explore it one way or another because they, they have to know kind of what the market is like. Yeah, but I mean, let's be honest. Let's say they're the five seed by the trade deadline. They're having a good year. They're pretty close to the four. Maybe they're flirting with a three and we're like, what were they, were they the six seed when they, when they traded Plumlee? Uh, the year they traded Nurkic, they were trash. They were in the playoff picture that year. Are you sure? Because I could have swore because we they had were... Nurk fever. Yeah, they were they were right, they were right there, right on the edge. Uh, I'm gonna go back and look. I'm I, I might be wrong on this. You seem they very confident. A, they were not a great team, but they they, they had Nurk fever to, to push into the playoffs. I uh, see. Here's the thing. I remember them trading Plumlee, getting Nurk, and they were like at the bottom of the NBA. And I was more pissed that they didn't go for the draft pick. They traded. They got Nurk. He turned out to be a gem. They made a push to get to the postseason, and then he broke his leg. Maybe I'm wrong on that. The leg break was 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 later. That was that was twenty uh, seventeen. I had to think. God, about that. I was like, which I know all like, his all his seasons are bun are being bundled together. Yeah, he wait. No, you're right. He he had the earlier leg break. That's my mistake. He yeah, had, the first leg break. He had a stress <laughs> fracture. 
Yeah, I'm sorry. The other yeah, broken the leg. God. I totally, for, to be honest, I totally forgot he had that other now, displaced fracture. Here, I'm going to try to look it up right now. I know it's not great for on-air stuff, but I might be wrong. I could have swore I did a radio segment, and we were like, hey, Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, like there's talent in this year's, or maybe Jalen Brown was the next year, but it was like the Tatum draft. And I remember mm. thinking, God, if you could be in there. And they were only a couple games away from like bottom five. And then Neil made the trade and then they got they were, nerfed. They were in a crappy spot when they made that trade. I remember that. They were like two or three games, I think, away from being bottom five in the league. And I was like, I would rather have that pick than this trade. And then they made I think a turnaround. They were, they, I think they were close, but they, they definitely turned it around with Nurk Fever. 100%. Absolutely. 100%. Yes. Yeah, 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 they turned a, a corner. They became like top 10 in defense and everything. Yeah, it was that was what spurred everything, and it was pure insanity. Um, I'm looking this up in the background, by no, the no, way, and I'll let you know that, when I find fine. the info. But just like the whole general idea of there's no sacred cows other than Damian Lillard. That's it. Like, there, there's there's just not. And they're, yeah. they're going to – we're going to cover this season, this entire year, with this specter of Damian Lillard wanting out, not wanting out, blah, 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 all season long. And every single thing that we discuss, everything that we talk about, everything that we look at is going to have that framing around it. And so if things aren't going as well as you want them to, do you you know, lock it down and really try to make something happen with the guys that you have? Or do you preemptively make moves at the deadline to shake things up while also planning for the future? And I think that's kind of where I've seen some people, oh, he's too important to this team. He's not important to this team if Damian Lillard leaves. Yeah. A 28-year-old center, free agent center, is not important to this team if Damian Lillard is, is out. So trying to figure that out. Like, I don't envy Neil because he put himself in this position with some just monstrously stupid ideas along the way, but this is the situation that they're in now that they have to try to figure out, which it's one of those things where you're like, oh, God. So did we trade him? It was the 16-17 season. Mm -hmm. Am Am I right on that? Yep. So they fought. They got to the, yeah, I was right. So they sucked that year. They got Nurkic. He Nurk fevered his way in. They got to 500 and got the eight seed and lost. Was the it the eight State. seed? It was the eight seed. Okay, so they I were thought, 41 I they were and seven. 41. Yeah. Okay. No, they're 41 and 41. Yeah, because they were they were only like five five seven games under 500 when I think when they when they made that trade. Yeah, it was February like 16th, 17th, and they had just lost like four of their last five. That was the thing the is they six. looked like crap over yes. a two week stretch, and that's kind yes. of what forced their hands. Yep. Because they were they were a middling like 500-ish team uh, up until then. And then they just kind of cratered. But yeah, long story short, Nurk's good. He makes the team better. But it only goes so far. And I don't think he's, he's again, he's not a sacred cow. So do I think that Yusuf Nurkic could get traded at the deadline? Yes. Regardless of what Yusuf Nurkic says on Twitter when somebody else says that it's a good idea to, to possibly look at trading him. Yeah, can I, can I just say I... We all have different opinions, and sometimes we get really – we have a disagreement on opinions. Twitter is for hot takes, opinions, thoughts, et cetera. I find it odd when athletes are not tagged in tweets to find the tweet and then try to, like, humiliate a person. It's like, bro, he, that person's not the only one that thinks you, we should trade you. Like, do you think this is some – and then, of course, I've, you get the fanboys. I've heard about it a couple times, so. Well, and then you get the, the fanboys of the players. You get the 16 to 20-year-olds with the anime avatars. And you're never gonna win. Like you're the, the no name. They're like, who, who, who the fuck are you, man? Like yeah. we don't even know who you are. Hold this L like, or ratio, and it's like, yeah, uh, and it's like, okay, cool, because because you're defending the multi million dollar athlete who's so bored that he googled his name on Twitter. Cool. Let's be honest. Let, let's pull a curtain back here real quick. If you are a multi millionaire athlete, are you googling your own or, or searching your own name? I, nobody believes me if I say this. If I was a multi-million dollar athlete or person, I wouldn't have a personal account that I'm ever tweeting from. I have I a would. manager who tweet. No, just control that. just controls your brand. Controls just the, the brand. corniest, Dude. weakest, Danny, corporate the best week, thing ever. One of the best weeks of my entire life was when I went to Hawaii. I didn't have my phone in my hand at all. I didn't care. I it's didn't know true. what was going on. I texted on you world. that way you'd have it when you got back and you're like, sorry, dude. I'm like, yeah, no, I didn't expect an answer. I was just putting it there so that when you did see it, you would know what was going on and you didn't come into, oh yeah, by the way. <laughs> is that a uh, is that an old generation cup that you just have there? Oh, it's a new one. Okay. Okay. You know, listen, at least it's the L train. 
My mom threw away the uh, Dairy Queen ones. This is the uh, the ones the Blazers remade in 1314. Oh, uh, okay, gotcha. Yeah. yeah, my my brother-in-law had season tickets then, and they gave him, they were like, hey, we got too many. So they gave season ticket holders more if they wanted them. And he was like, can I get like six? And they were like, yeah, here's six. So he has a man cave. And at the top of the man cave on the mantle, just a there's pile like of glasses, six glasses in boxes stacked in a unique formation. I'm like, why do you have six of those? He's like, why wouldn't you have why six of those? You know what I have uh, in that quantity? That makes no sense. Channing fry bobbleheads. No, well, you're, a, you're a fry guy, but why do you have that many? Well, I mean, I don't know. I don't know where the guy, like, I remember like getting them at that game. Yeah, but I don't remember why or how or if like they, they gave them away at another game. Like I gave those tickets to my sister or something like that. But I have like seven or eight Channing Fry bobbleheads still in the box, and they're they're still sitting at my parents. My parents ask me all the time, "When are you coming mm. to get this crap?" <laughs> <laughs> and the answer is, "Oh, oh, next time, next time." I got no room in the car. <laughs> Never, ever, ever leaves. Oh. Uh, another question here. Uh, from Cure at Jacob Curry 22. Do you think the offense is going to speed up this year or slow down and not push the pace? I think it's going to be a similar offense to what we saw. I think there's going to be moments, mm-hmm. but I think for the large part, especially if Nurkic is going to want to run things, like he's not running the fast break. So. It's a perfect lead in from that because if Nurk's touching the ball, let's go ahead and run on the checklist. Um, yes, there's a new coach involved. Uh, who's the point guard? Is it still Damian Lillard? Still Dame time. Okay. Uh, CJ McCollum still going to be uh, heavy on that ball? That he is, Daniel. And Yusuf Nurkic wants to touch the ball more, right? Far more, Daniel. Okay. Any of those three guys running up and down the floor to initiate the offense? No, but Norm might. Be like, give me these. I want the cherry picking buckets, man. <laughs> if, if there's anybody on this team that is going to do that, it's going to be Norm when he grabs a rebound and goes. He's going to be like, I'm going to hold it. He's sitting there going, I've had enough of this crap. Let's run. <laughs> yeah. But that's that's about it. I we're gonna hear the rhetoric. We're gonna play faster. We're gonna get more. Excuse me. I would say normally we're, it's the we're gonna get more threes up. But Chauncey was less threes. Then it was smarter threes. Then it was I'm just gonna step out of this and pick my foot out of my mouth. Uh, yeah, that was a bad moment for Chauncey. Yeah, the that was that was certainly uh he was running down the the, the cliches from his Pistons days, and he was like, oh crap, no, I gotta uh, you gotta get the 2.0. You shoot more threes now, Chauncey. Not, Chauncey, not, it's not going to be 55 to 57 with seven minutes to go in the game. That's not the kind of basketball oh, we're playing anymore. God, it's just pure hell. Uh, but overall, they may f- play faster in spurts, but it's going to be because of personnel. That second unit particularly, Zeller and Nance are going to allow you to play a bit quicker because you don't have – for anybody yeah. listening right now, i just doing the Ennis Cantor run. And actually, I have to admit, I did it pretty well. Um, <laughs> but also Carmelo Anthony, who the only thing he has ever sprinted for is a uh, trailing three. So, uh, yeah. That second unit, you're going to get Ant. You're going to get Snell. You're going to get Nance. You're going to get yep. Zeller. Who that fifth guy is remains to be seen. Um, but they'll play a bit faster. And that group will. The rest of them? I don't know. Starting unit, I wouldn't expect the pace to paint, pace to change all that much. Speaking of Ant and Nurk, Colin Pettit, at Colin Pettit, do you think any of Nurk, Ant, or Rocco get extensions before the season starts? Ant, Rocco, or Nurk. Uh, I don't think Nurk is going to get one. I think Neil would be smart to play that one out. Uh, Rocco, very similar situation. If it if S hits the fan, that's an asset you could maybe flip. Mm-hmm. And who was the other one? Ant. Oh, Ant. I think Ant, you know, I if they gave him, cool. But I think Ant's also in kind of a prove what that contract kind of is type situation. So I would say no to all three of those. I would as well. Uh, we should have Ant on the pod here relatively quickly. And that's one of the things we'll we'll, we'll talk about a little bit. We're not going to. That's 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 his negotiations and all that kind of stuff. But if whether or not we should expect anything before the season. Uh, I would assume at this point it's probably not, but I've also heard from a few birdies that uh, Ant has been looked at as a guy to take a massive, massive leap this year, that this coaching staff uh, views Ant as a guy that's going to be key for them going forward, and that's uh, from Billups and Brooks. So uh, I would fully expect Anthony Simons to be the no BS sixth man this season i love it i I hope look i i want nothing more and i know you you've admitted your slight bias but your love for anthony simons as a basketball player and what he can maybe turn into 
I, I want to see it, man. I do. Like, I was a little cold waterish on him last year when, you know, they, they needed a backup point guard. I wondered, should they go get somebody? And they gave him some burn, and I'll give it to him. I thought he stepped up. and Second half he, of the season, he was a different player. He, yeah, and he was a lot of catch and shoot, but it was still, like, really nice to see him have that confidence, have that Indiana game, and still go, okay, maybe this kid can get better. And that's the thing that we long overlook in this kind of discussion stuff. Is he's 22, you know, I don't know where, I don't, we'll see where Nas is, but like to have young assets, you don't like it with prime players, but then what you get in a couple of years is those young assets become real players, hopefully for your rotation. Mm -hmm. So in a way it's, it's almost like picking up a free agent. I'm excited to see what Ant can do this year. Yeah, I, I am too. Unquestionably. I, I think that's going to be one of the big questions this year. Uh, the Roco one, I think if they get some sort of sign, that Dame is gone. He's him and Nurk are the first two that are that are going to get sold at the deadline, hundred percent. Like those are those are contending pieces. Kind of like if there's a team out there like, oh crap, Covington's on the market. We can Roko would be a very good pickup for yeah, a lot of teams. For really any team because yeah. he can just plug in and he can be your four. He can be the, your stretch. He can play some small ball five. Uh, he can. I really in. like him if Miami were to step up. Oh God, Miami or Phoenix. You know, yeah. those are the kind of teams that, you know, to be honest, I mean, any any good team is going to want a Covington. Like, right. that's legitimately how – he's just a good player. Yeah. Um, and because he doesn't really need the ball to be that effective and to do the things that he does, you you can you can find takers for him. But I, I don't expect any of these guys to get new deals before um, before the season. But if anybody's going to get one, it's going to be Ant. Uh, the other two, they're going to ride that out and kind of see how that goes. Uh, this from Triple Cerberus at Eric J. Also, okay, the obvious one. Can we hope to see more of Nurk based on him coming in, not coming in as out of shape this time, and his comments about Billups, or is, or is that just summer gain ten pounds of muscle in a three pointer talk? I love it. I love the listeners. They're 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 picking up on the cliches now too. I've been working on my three point shooting. You know, I don't think he comes in out of shape. I do think he comes in rejuvenated. I look. I, I buy the the comments in the he's excited to get a restart with a new coach, with maybe it? a new system. Right? Yeah, exactly. Um, does that mean he's actually going to add the three point arsenal to his game? Uh, he's I heard dabbled. This, he's dabbled. Bro, but I know. I heard this two or three years ago. It's like he might make that Marcus All leap. Marcus All shot like two threes. And then the next year he was shooting like four a game. Like mm -hmm. Brooke Lopez never shot perimeter shots, and now that's all he shoots. Let's give those guys a little credit. They're really good players. I it don't also know doesn't happen just, almost ever. Those are two examples yeah. out of like you know the, the extremes. I don't think Nurkic is gonna do that. At Ten pounds of muscle. I think he's gonna largely look the same in you know in shape, fit Nurk. And I think a lot of this is lip service till we see otherwise. Uh, from Helvy at Hell to the Have. Does Nas make the year three jump? I'm really hoping that him and Ant become the one-two punch off the bench. Does Chauncey turn Nas into a slash in the second year or park him behind the three-point line? Dan, you need it. You, you need Nas to take a leap. I don't know if he's going to. I know you hear things from people all the time. Um, I I hope he does. They need it. They could use a Nas here little on the rotation. They don't have anybody with size who can put the ball on the floor. Nobody. He is the only guy that they have who, with real size and strength, could be a downhill guy. Like, Dame's big, quote-unquote, strength-wise, for his position. Nobody else in this team can get downhill big. Norm can get downhill, but he's not. Mm -hmm. He's playing up a spot. Nas is playing down a spot, in all seriousness. So, is this the year that he makes the jump? I don't know. I don't know where he's going to sit right now in the pecking order, to be honest. Why do you bring in a Tony Snell if you're if you Nas is going to be that guy? I think insurance. Sure, and he is only Cheap. he is only a minimum guy. Yep. But I've also heard that there were other offers out there for Tony Snell, and he decided to come to Portland, which doesn't happen all that often. Let's be honest. Um, you you look at who the Blazers have been able to sign for minimums. Snell and Zeller are, are probably on the higher side of the curve as far as like, eh, those are useful players on minimum deals. Mm -hmm. um, but when you're talking about as Snell as it, you know, as it relates to, to Nasir, I don't, I don't know where this coaching staff and where Neil O'Shea and the, and the, and the franchise view Nas right now. Uh, yeah. It's, I hope so because he's, he is much like Ant has shown flashes where you're like, 
okay. I, you know, the 30-point game against Milwaukee, uh, his ability to get downhill. The I see this talked about a lot, the whole idea of Nas being this uh, or having the ability to be a really good defender. He's still young. He's he's not, you know, a defensive savant. He, he, he has the tools to be a good defender someday. And I think there's a difference between those two because he is long. He's got a dumb wingspan. Like mm-hmm. Nas is, he's uh, like he's got around seven two. He's six 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 seven. He's strong as hell. Like, yeah, I mean, he is athletic as hell. Like he's in the got Blazers, all the things. They they don't have those guys. He is the yeah. only guy that they have that is like that. So you need him to hit, and that's that's been a problem for Portland for years. Is they just haven't had athletes that have all of the things. Like let's look at last year's roster real quick. You've got Ant and Derek Jones Jr., some of the best leapers in the game. But what are they both? They're both Lynn. They're both thin. Lynn. Wow. They're both thin and lanky. Not Jeremy Lynn. Uh, Stook. Stook. St- lean. Yeah. Lynn. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're, they're thin and lean. Nas has uh, got real size to it. So, yeah. as far as, like, do you turn him into a slasher or park him behind the three-point line? I don't think it's either. I think you just put him in positions to be successful, which getting out in transition where he can use his athleticism. He's t- put a ton of work in his three-point shot. Can he get the opportunity and then go out and deliver? Because with a young coaching staff, if you go out there and deliver, they're going to come back to you. But if you don't, they've got stuff to prove. Dame's, you know, on again, on the precipice. That's going to probably dictate how they do some things. So it's going to be a little, a little weird. Yeah. Uh, this was also I, re- related to here. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, like, he's more so than Nurk, like, this is a year for guys like Ant Nas to come in and go chip on the shoulder. I have a lot to prove to myself. Yeah. A lot to prove to people. You're, you're probably not wrong on the Snell stuff. Like the observation of why did you choose Portland when you could have gone somewhere else? That doesn't happen often. I, I just, I'm not going to panic if they're 10 games in and he's not really in the rotation. And if somebody's ahead of him, you know, whoever's in front not, of him better be doing something because if they're better be adding. Yes. Because if you're a, a replacement level player, I, right. My rule has always been, I would I would much rather take the peaks and valleys of developing a young guy than just sticking the replacement level guy out there. Oh, no doubt. That, that, that's that's my own philosophy. I'm not going to also conclude five games in if Nas is getting zero PT, that Nas is this or that. Like This season's long. I, we need to remind yeah. people, I know it's 10 games shorter. It's kind of like baseball. Don't way overreact 22 games into the season like, Nas might find himself in the rotation. It might not just be right away, but we'll have to wait and see because, to your point, we don't know where he stands right now. Yeah. This from Nibble, at Nibble underscore two by two. Do Aunt Nas, and Greg know about how great Abby's pizza is? Mm. Nibble is hitting on something that's right up our alley, Mm -hmm. and I would say no, they probably don't know. But, but... They will soon find out because if you guys use promo code Jacked Ramsey's at your next checkout of Abby's, you get zero percent off. But 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 they hear about Jacked Ramsey's and they like us more that way. They, they so do like th- us already. Did they then, did they start following you? I think they did follow me. I think I need to follow them back. They, actually, you but, were uh, you were. This is why you should hire a social media manager. Yeah, you I'm, are I'm the awful. worst. I th- thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. I, How long did it I, take you to change your bio after going from uh, one time slot to another? Six uh, months? You know, like seven months. <laughs> Who was it again that was, told you to change it? It was you. Oh, right. You also told me that I had tagged the wrong BetQL for my Back to the Future show. <laughs> I didn't even know that. So I clicked on it. I'm like, oh, my God, take a look at it and see what they got going for their site. And then I was like, oh, God, Sprague, no. Oh, no, dude. No. It's, it's the social media demon. I, I – I don't want to be on social media, but I have to. Yeah, no, but it's. I, I think it's, it's awful. It's a lot easier if you just embrace it. Just embrace how stupid it is. I'm telling you. Okay. Embrace I'll the do suck. It. There you go. I'll do it. Uh, this from Taryn Benedict at Taryn Benedict. I love people who just their their name is their handle. It's just so much easier, right? Shout out to listen to you, you, those of you that don't. You you change it up. That's fine. For me, it's just a lot easier. To, it's just it's a lot more seamless. This is a, a good question because I think this can go a million different ways about, um, well, I'll, I'll tease this one. What are some good Greg Brown III comps? Is he someone to be passively optimistic about? 
I mean, I don't know how you saw that pick and didn't get passively optimistic. It was a uh, shot. I don't know how in the you dark. saw summer league and not got passively optimistic. It was a shot in the dark pick that it's like if it doesn't hit, nobody's going to really be critical. And if he does, you're going to be like, man, what a fine, right? Mm-hmm. It's going to be the Gary Trent Jr. deal all over again. I, I don't know what his, you know, like what his ceiling is, but seeing some things in summer league, it left me optimistic that he's going to really bust some guys' ass in practice. He's going to push guys. Somebody's going to really get harder. banged on in practice. There is somebody's no getting doubt. jammed on. <laughs> like he's going to be the guy. He might be the guy you hear about in the background of what the season is. Like Moses not- Brown. Moses Brown was that when he was here. That's they talked one. about how yep. dominant yep. he was on the practice floor defensively, but mentally he just wasn't prepared for the NBA. And now he's you know gobbling up rebounds like there's no tomorrow. Yeah. Who, when you I, watch Greg play, who does he remind you of? Because this is ooh. this is where I think it could go a million different ways. I'm not sure which which one it is. That's see. Here's the tough part with answering that question. How polished do you think he is in he's, all the he's aspects? He's as, he's of the as game? raw as it gets. Right. So how I don't know how to answer that question mm-hmm. if he's raw in every area of basketball. He's one of the best. Who athletes. do you who do you see? You may sound like you have an answer to this, and you you threw that at me, and I'm like, I, I don't know. I don't I, even know how to I answer I see that stupidly raw Tyrus Thomas. <laughs> oh, Tyrus Thomas. I remember Tyrus. I was excited about Tyrus Thomas as a draft pick, and then they swipped, swipped him for When they uh, traded LA. Tyrus, I was the happiest man alive because I Oh, no, I, I was ecstatic. I, I liked L.A. too. I'm just saying I remember Tyrus because I loved watching him play at LSU, but when they flipped him for L.A., I was like, oh, okay, I'm in. <laughs> but – I see a guy that just has unreal timing and bounce. Yep. But I don't know about the other stuff. And I think that's what kind of held Tyrus back is the other stuff. Greg has been really open about, you know, what to, what he needs to do. And, you know, in the, in the opening introductory press conference, he's like, I need to work on dribbling. I need to work on shooting. I need to work on defense. Like he basically just listed everything. And yeah. I need to work on this. He is a guy who I think has relied a lot on his athleticism, but he can because he has stupid athleticism. Let's not forget the man East Bay Funk Funk dunked in a damn game. Off, Just insane. Off stupid. one without a bounce. Off one, one. Yeah, oh my God. <laughs> so it's not just like, oh, he's a good NBA athlete. No, he's a six foot eight supreme athlete. If he adds anything to his game, he can be a functional NBA player. And Mm -hmm. you and I have talked about this. When you talk about young guys, what is their skill set? And what was my knock against, you know, a Zach Collins or a Caleb Swanigan or anything like that? When I looked at Zach, I go, what? What's the thing that gets him on the floor? And I'm like, he does things well, but eh." with Swanigan, I was like, well, I think he can do this well. And then he turned out he could not. (laughs) When I look at Greg Brown, I go, well, I see a guy who's really big really athletic and the Blazers don't have either of those things in spades. So could he find himself on a floor late February when guys are tired and and somebody in the front court's a little nicked up? Yeah, I think I could. And in three years, we'll check the incubator again and see what happens. Like it, but I, that's the thing is like, as far as his comps, there's, there's nothing to go off of yet. He's got kind of a Harry Giles vibe to me. I'm excited to have yeah. him. I don't know if he's going to play. I don't know what he's going to offer, I guess, on the court, but he leaves me excited and maybe a little optimistic that he can develop into something. And I know Harry is at a different point in his career and maybe hasn't done that, but I liked Harry Giles coming out of the draft. I would have been okay with Portland. Like, and I, you know, again, I know they traded picks and all that, but I was, you know, curious to see what he was going to be in coming to Portland. And obviously it didn't really work out the way he thought he, it would, but there's a real Harry Giles vibe with Greg of, untapped potential, you know, uh, incredible You can see athlete. it going one of 87 different ways. Yeah, there's a lot to that. Which I don't think is necessarily a bad thing. That's No, no, it's not a bad thing at all. So it's just it's just one of those things where it's like, uh, I don't know. Uh, this is another more of a, uh, a, a theory question. This is from Andrew John, at AJ underscore VD. Do you think any of our previous GMs would have kept this group together for so long? And what old GM do you wish was the GM for the Lillard era. 
Uh, based on everybody I've talked to, Chad Buchanan, and I would say no. I don't think any of them do. Not Witsit, not Choi, not Witsit Buchanan. Is, Witsit is 100% not doing it. Witsit would have traded CJ in the second year of the Dame CJ era. 100%. <laughs> he would have been, like, been like, wait a minute. Nope. I, can get, I can get Jason Terry and Al Horford for CJ McCollum. Yeah. I'm in. Yeah. Let's do it. Um, so, no. Okay, quick answer. No, I don't believe any other general manager holds on to this era as long as the current general manager has. And you said Buchanan? Yeah, I would Which, pick Buchanan. If I could have somebody, it would have been Chad Buchanan. I'm going to go the other side of that coin. I'm going to go KP. Yeah, no, that's a – Pritchard's a good one. I, I liked Pritchard a lot. You know, the stories I'd hear behind the scenes of how that actually went bad was strange. But the Buchanan one is that's, that's a long story. It's a very long story. And obviously, I feel like everybody has a different variation of that story. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, Chad gets a lot of credit for the Dame fine. He should oh, get fine. Let's, let's, well, let's okay. be honest. Also, let's not call it a fine. Dame was going to be a top 10 player with the Blazers or not, but it still took the balls to, to scout and pull the trigger at that to spot. do that for a Weber state kid. Right. Yes. But, um, I don't know if he would have picked CJ. In fact, I don't know if I would have bet that he would have picked CJ. I think he would have tried to no. go more traditional fit. Whereas Neil did, uh, he, you know, the, Hey, I want back to back point guards thing. So I don't, you know, because let's be honest, when they were looking at CJ, they, they saw a sixth man. Yeah, with that group. Yeah, yeah. with the group that they had, which was... Which is what, the they, is what that team needed. One of the hills I'll die on. I still think he would have been like Jamal Crawford-esque off the bench for him, which would have been nice. I think he would have been better. I think he would have been closer to Manu Light. Oh, Manu Light. He just got me even more aroused. I, if that would have been the role that he was put into, Jason Terry, Manu type role yeah, yeah, yeah. from day one, which if Wes doesn't tear his Achilles, is probably the role that he has slotted in for for a couple of years. Because well, it, you, you're assuming that they resign, they bring that whole group back. I think they legitimately, if, if Wes doesn't tear his Achilles, that team probably goes to the Western Conference Finals and LaMarcus doesn't leave. They would have lost to Golden State, but I think you're right. Because if they if they're that, group that was good, stout. if yeah. they're that good, Lamarcus leaves that, then it's definitely not about anything but himself. It's ego, yeah. And, it's and, and at ego. that point, I don't think he could have taken like we knew what was kind of going on behind the scenes as far as that kind of stuff, but that would have got shot everywhere right. if that had been the, the the this this is some real like alternate timeline Loki stuff. Oh, here. absolutely. But uh, that's that's something I I definitely do believe is that. This just kind of plays off what we were talking about last week. The whole idea of like roles. If CJ's role was always to be the sixth man, then it's a lot easier to just keep him there or to convince him even after you pay him, hey, right. we still need you to be. Lou Williams is a perfect example. He, he stayed in that role. Jamal stayed in that role. Like plenty of guys that were sixth men like stayed in that role for a really long time because they got theirs and everybody knew every season that they were a sixth man of the year, you know, candidate. Right. So, all right, this is the last question we got, and we'll get out of here because Brandon is, is struggling with that, that Sunday night TV game up in the corner. I'm not struggling. <laughs> I got the Chiefs minus three, and I, I don't I even think, need to watch I it. I think you're doing okay covering. at this point they're, in time. I have, uh, I have like four parlays right now, and they're all hinging on the Chiefs to win this game by three. Which, how the hell does the line only three? Well, it's it's a rivalry game. It's on the road, but I'm with you. And as we speak right now, Kansas City just went up 11. Yeah. Like I said, not really having to worry all that much. This from Nicholas, uh, at yeah. Nicholas McKern. How much of what we hear from Billups is standard, in quotes, new coach rhetoric, i.e. new system, big changes, etc.? Is there reason to buy into the idea that the talk will actually amount to different results defensively? Oh, defensively? I think that is I text this to you and it's eye opening to me. And I cannot believe this is not a maybe it is a bigger conversation. I think the fact that Chauncey has openly admitted he doesn't know defense as well as people think he does at the press conference. And then he just recently in the quick piece, there's a blurb about he reached gonna, out to guys. <laughs> he reached out to guys and he's gonna really rely on Scott Brooks. Uh-huh. Danny, I, I got bored one night. Do you know what I looked up? I looked up Scott Brooks's defensive rankings uh, via NBA.com, mm. and I looked him up every year he's been a coach. And what I did will they say, rank, Brandon? 
Well, in the beginning at Oklahoma City, Danny, they had very good defensive teams. I think he had three teams in the top 10, one in the top five, got to four. Weird how when having he, Serge Ibaka, Steven Adams, and Andre Roberson, it's, it's a good defensive uh, team. I also had Kevin Durant. And, and Russell you know Westbrook. What, oh, do you know what happened when Kevin Durant left? Oh, what? They started dropping to 15 to 18, and then he got fired. And then you know where they've been in Washington? One of the worst. 28, 27. Mm -hmm. 18 and 20, which is basically another way of a million ways that I've been saying uh, personnel matters. Yeah. I mean, I don't know why that's even a debate. I don't know how we watch the NBA our entire lives and still pick up more personnel than it is coaching. That being said, it's a different conversation, I guess, for a different day. Uh, I think he'll, he'll be different. How? That's the impossible thing for me to answer. He's clearly going to be. He's got different instincts than Terry, right? He played at that. a higher level. He's, he's got. He's not coaching the defense. Roy Rogers. He's is. not. Roy Rogers and Scott Brooks are going to be more in charge of the defense than Chauncey Billups. So I don't know if the defense is going to get better. There's nothing to make me feel like it's going to take this leap that Neil probably thinks it's going to take. But if mm -hmm. you told me they finished 21 to 18. I think that sounds about right. I think they if can finish 15th it's solely off the fact right. that they don't have Ennis Cantor and Carmelo Anthony playing 25 minutes a night. Great, but 15 wouldn't have been good enough for Terry. Oh, God, no. They, he had to finish top 10 with that team to keep his job. Okay, so in that way, I'd say defense is kind of a pretty much, uh, I don't think it's going to vastly improve. Offensively, I will have to wait and see what he does with this Nurkic stuff. But uh, to answer that question in a long-winded way, it's going to be different. I just don't know if it's going to be substantially better i think you can see something for other people who i've seen people argue that that terry didn't try anything new last year and it was like did you not watch the first 12 games of the season they were trying to trap they were trying to blitz they were playing above the level they were pushing to the sideline they were doing so many more things the problem was they sucked at it they sucked <laughs> and it was just like oh god they can't do this they yeah. brought they brought in boylan to be more aggressive in the off season, and they tried oh, they it, and it was a disaster. <laughs> they didn't listen to Jim, did they? No, nobody. Did he make them do push-ups if they didn't rotate fast? Probably. Enough? <laughs> but that's 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 a different story, all for its own. Uh, but do I think it can be, it can and will get better? Yes, but primarily because the two biggest culprits, not named Damian Lillard and Cantor and Mello, won't be getting those minutes, and you replace them with guys who are significantly better than them. But on a league side, Nance is better than average. Zeller's average. Like that's that's going to take you probably to from 28, 29 to 20 to 22 on its own. Because you don't have your entire front court is no longer a liability. It's amazing what happens when when your entire front court is no longer a liability, along with your back court. <laughs> so hey, that's how it goes. I right. rely on health. That's for sure. Yeah, that's that's another big part of this. All right, let's get out of here. Uh, you've got a busy week coming up. What do you got going? Just you got the radio show, 6 to 9 a.m. on 1080 The Fan. We'll dive into a lot of the, the Pac-12 throwing up all over itself. Does USC have a quarterback controversy? They absolutely should. They should. Uh, Oregon they hit, State getting 13. We, we, we didn't I even talk it. about this yet. I, I, I've did. texted you a thousand times. I know. Praise God USC lost to Stanford. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. I fight on, baby. Fight I text on. you that that after that game. Yeah. If this doesn't get Helton fired, nothing will. And he got fired the very next day. And I was day. like, oh, please God. Please God. Shout out to so we'll dive. Hart. We'll dive into that. Jake Hayner, I legitimately think. I, I don't think it's hyperbole to say Jake Hayner gave us like a top 25 college football performance of all time. I, I really no. don't. That was uneffing believable yeah. to win that game with what looked like a broken hip. So we'll dive into some Pac-12 stuff. We'll talk national college football, a lot of NFL, and uh, maybe a little NBA this week as well. But it's going to be a lot of football on 1080 The Fan from 6 to 9 a.m. And then, uh, of course, catch me on here. And my other show, Back to the Futures, on the BetQL Network. I do every Sunday uh, at 5 p.m. local time till 6 p.m. on the Odyssey app and the BetQL Network. We'll have some uh, some betting features coming up on here. I'm, I'm clearing with our sponsors and all that kind of stuff to make sure that we're, we're good to go and that way it gets you the legal verbiage so you don't get in trouble <laughs> because we have so many different contracts going right uh but uh now that it's officially officially official 
Uh, it's a it's a good time to say we've got Greg Brown coming on the podcast this week. So boom, uh, I will be doing that one solo dolo. Uh, Brandon will be coming in a little bit later. So if it sounds like it's just me, uh, it's going to be just me um, uh, until the, the latter half. So uh, scheduling is what it is because, well, uh, Brandon has uh, children and Greg has training <laughs> camp coming up. So uh, basically, Both very important. Is, I don't have a life because I can't move. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, look forward to that. Uh, we're working to get a few other guys booked before training camp gets underway. And that's right. September 28th is training camp. We are under two weeks away, which means we are the 19th, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the 19th. if you were listening to this, you're probably listening Monday morning or you're downloading late Sunday night. And we are a month. We are a month. Singular month away from NBA basketball. I love it. From It's not just NBA basketball. Trailblazer basketball. Dun, dun, dun. You love to see it. This is this, this offseason is over so quick. So, 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 so quick. So uh, it's going to be, it's going to be wild. Uh, you know, subscribe to the podcast, rate review, help us grow this thing. Man. We have a you. lot of fun doing it. Look at we have you. a lot of fun interacting with you guys. You have great questions. And I think this season's going to be fantastic. We'll maybe hit the side of a mountain and we lose Damian Lillard. Absolutely. That's a possibility. It is going to be interesting. No matter how you slice it. Always going to be interesting. Never so. boring with Neil O'Shea and the blaze. <laughs> uh, follow at Brandon Sprague at Jack Ramsey's at Danny Morang across on Twitter. Uh, like, rate, review, subscribe. Like Sprague said, you guys have done a fantastic job helping us grow the show already. Literally every episode does better than the next, um, which is insane for a Blazers offseason where everybody's walking on tiptoes, uh, terrified of their own shadow. So uh, thank you all so, so, so much. Uh, we'll have Greg on midweek. Uh, I'll probably drop that as soon as we get done uh, as a bonus into the feed. We will be bumping the live show to Wednesdays, just so you guys know, because Thursday night football, the season getting underway. Uh, and then those will adjust as we get in the season. Uh, game nights, it's going to cause some things to kind of go around. And we'll probably start recording the mailbag on a different day, too, because uh, Brandon's busy. So <laughs> that's just kind of how this goes. We all, we hey, have, we'll figure it out. We have a million stuff, million shows going on, but we'll, we're gearing up for the regular season. We've got a ton of things coming. Uh, for game night, uh, I'll probably sneak some pregame stuff in there. And I know a ton of people have asked about making uh, fan appearances on the show. I am trying to effort a way to do that, like once a month kind of a deal. Maybe we'll do it for a donation barrier for for charities or something like that. Um, we'll, we'll work some folks in. Uh, I'm still working stuff, workshopping stuff. And for everybody out there yelling about the mics, I'm sorry. Once we move into the studio, <laughs> it'll be cleaned up. I promise. Uh, hmm. For everybody else out there, thank you all so, so, so very much. Uh, we'll talk to you all soon. Uh, bye. Bye.